Hey everybody, welcome to Little Known Stocks, the show where I aim to prove that being boring and doing your research can make you money. Now today I'm going to talk about a company called Embracer Group. Now Embracer Group own 240 IPs in the gaming space, they own 63 development studios, more than double that of EA, and employ over 7,000 people. So why have you never heard of them? And are they a prime candidate for early investment? Let's find out. Now it is worth noting that if you're looking for an easy trade, Embracer Group is not going to be for you. You won't find Embracer on traditional apps like Trading212, Robinhood or any of the others that are similar uh, because they're not listed on an official exchange yet. And we'll come on to that later in the video. But they are uh, available. You will have to do a bit more digging and companies like Hargreaves, Lansdowne, more traditional brokers will have them available. But even then, in order to buy these shares, you're actually going to have to phone up the brokerage. You won't be able to buy them online, which is why they're, they're more difficult to acquire. But sometimes putting a little bit of effort up front gets better return on the back end. I first heard about Embracer Group around August 2017 when they acquired Black Forest Games. And since then, really, under the guise of THQ Nordic, and that name may be more familiar to you, they've been aggressively purchasing studios, intellectual properties, and anything they can get their hands on, basically. I'm about to show you a, a small clip from a show that I, I watch, uh, but basically they haven't got a very good name in the industry for this. People seem to think they're buying up junk, and they're just spending all the money that they've got, getting money from some black hole somewhere. But in fact, I think looking into the company in more detail, there's a lot more to it than that, and this could be a real candidate for, for an investment for a rapid growth company in the near future. So listen to this clip, this should give you some idea as to what the game industry think about Embracer Group at the present time. But uh, I, you know, this is, are, are we surprised? No. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm surprised that it's at, at who they bought, but I'm not surprised that they bought, like, a handful of other studios. They just seem to be doing this. I, I might just make a game studio just, just so THQ can buy it. So as you can see, they're a pretty damning review of THQ Nordic, Embracer Group. Um, the two are, are used quite interchangeably in the media. Uh, people really don't understand what this company is about. And it will take a lot of uh, games to come out and, and them to really establish themselves in the gaming market for people to see more what the direction of Embracer Group is. But I think we have enough information at the moment that we can really understand where they're going and whether they're going to be a success in future. So let's talk about the management of the company. Now, when we think about the management of Embracer Group, really, it's a one-man band. And this man, Lars Vingenfors, and I'm sure I've butchered that, is really the only person that we need to think about and worry about um, when we're thinking about Embracer. And the reason that is, uh, is Lars is a not a majority shareholder, but he owns 31% of the shares, but he owns more than 50% of the voting right. So this is essentially a privately owned company still. Um, with, with Lars being able to make all the decisions independently. So m unlike other companies, it's really, really, really important that we understand what the CEO wants, what his direction is, and, and what he plans for the company in the future if we want to invest. Uh, in terms of Lars's history, uh, he's, he's a really interesting guy with a, with a really interesting background. When he was 13, he founded LW Comics. Now, this was a, a used comic uh, mail order service and um, you know he made 300,000 kroner annually which to put in context is around $37,000 so not a lot but for a 13 year old uh, I don't know what I would have done with $37,000 but knowing Lars I'm sure he reinvested it um, and at the age of 16 he then took that on and created Nordic Games a, a gaming retailer essentially um, and it, it was the equivalent of Game or GameStop in Sweden. Um, he opened seven locations and then in the 90s he sold those stores for £6 million pounds of share options. So really substantial. Um, subsequently he bought it back for one kroner or around seven pence. Uh, so really, really amazing <laughs> return there. Just a few years later. Now, unfortunately, that, that company went bankrupt eventually. He wasn't able to turn it around. But it just goes to show that really he's thinking about opportunities. He's always looking for niches 
um, and, and really seems like a, a great businessman from the, from a very early age. He then went on to establish Nordic Games, hence the name THQ Nordic. Um, he was taking originally taking unsold games and repacking them, selling them to niche retailers in different areas. Uh, so really looking looking more regionally or globally there. Um, the idea was initially just just to do that, but he took it on and he really started to look into the development of games. So he he developed he. Uh, a, a small game to begin with he noticed that the karaoke games on playstation sing star were lacking on nintendo platforms so he then took uh, took an idea on playstation and he developed a very similar one for uh, nintendo so again he's looking for niches in the market uh, and it really went from then uh, he, he later bought the thq uh, name and really some of the licenses for THQ. And that's the company more like we know today in Embracer Group, looking at what are opportunities, what are areas that they could invest in, um, areas that have a gap in the market that we'll see shortly um, and, and continue to expand. And they continue to expand to this day. And, and it sounds like they will continue to do for, so for, for many, many years. So now we know more about Lars and what he's done to build the company over the past few years. Now we need to understand what he wants to do for the company going forward and how he's going to manage the company, what sort of management style he has. Is he going to be a, a very authoritative with that 51% voting rights that he's got or does he want to let people get on? So I'm going to show you a short clip from the investor presentation which I think gives you an insight into what he'll be looking at going forward. And I'm a true believer of letting great people making their own decisions. The decentralized decentralized philosophy, empowering individuals, creativity and speed is critical to our success. We are offering uh, the benefits of a large structure for most access to capital, the knowledge sharing and all our soft synergies across the group, but quite strict synergies on a daily basis more within the groups. And we believe this is the most attractive model for long-term creatives and entrepreneurs. We'll, we'll help bring more publishers and students on board this group. So very clear there what the strategy is really. I mean, Lars clearly states he doesn't want to interfere with the with the, the sub brands. Um, he sees them each having their own internal strategy, and you know they may have one unified direction, but he's not going to interfere in the day to day running. He wants to see daily talks within the the satellites, we'll call them, um, but less frequent talking at the group level. Although he does want to provide capital. And he does want to provide time. And, and one of the things he mentioned in this presentation was that quality of the products, the end products, is really key to him, um, really key to the group. And we've seen that with Biomutant as an example. It's been delayed several times to make sure they launch with quality. And that will be really a first test of what's Embracer Group going to be like. This is a big release uh, for them. Is it going to be a quality title? Are there going to be plagues of bugs? Is it not going to be a finished product? That will really be a test of what the future of the Embracer Group releases look like. If they can be a studio that combats some of the things that we've seen from EA or Activision trying to rush out games that aren't finished, if they can combat that and come up with some really quality products, some of the acquisitions that they've made that might be considered subpar or AA rather than AAA studios, they might take that step up and they might produce a more quality product, which can only be good for the group. Now, the flip side to that is... You, there is a reason why these larger companies want to get uh, get these products out on time. They want to hit the quarter that they originally state because they want to do it for their shareholders. So, um, you know, if a product's delayed, it means you've got more development time, more more costs up front, uh, and that that could be a bad thing for the studio. So we'll also have to look at the the seventy projects that they've got on the slate for next year. How many of them slip back, and is that a trend that's going to continue for Embracer Group? 
Now thinking about some of the acquisitions that they're going to make going forward, we really need to understand what their plan is and whether they continue to want to grow at this rapid rate or whether they're going to slow down. Maybe they're going to change from smaller cap to larger cap companies. It would be really useful to understand. So here's another clip from the presentation, which I think gives a good idea as to what their, their plan is. I, I still believe we are able to continue our strategy being disciplined under the same principles going forward. And I would like to point out that we are a true, truly independent company and platform with only approximately 1% of the global gaming market. And the main competitors we are facing out there in the dialogues on a daily basis are companies that are significantly larger than us. Sometimes up to 100 times or more larger than Embracer Groups. So there he's, he's clearly directing that they're going to continue to grow the acquisition. We don't know what size of acquisitions they're going to make, but what he does also highlight is one of the potential risks in their strategy, that there is a lot of consolidation in the market. We have people like Microsoft now buying up a huge number of game studios, similar to Embracer Group, uh, but with a massive amount of money uh, behind them in terms of their backing. So this is a huge risk. Um, it, it may be that some, some of the studios that they're looking to acquire in future go elsewhere and you will start to see more and more consolidation from the big players in the market. Now, what he's also saying is Embracer Group are independent. He's mentioned that many, many times, that they will let studios get on with what they want to do. And that's really what he's, he's banking on to enable them to, um, them to acquire studios over bigger players, that the freedom that they will allow will be much greater. Now, in terms of how acquisitions have performed to date, uh, there's actually some impressive data on that as well and you can see there's a, a large number of projects that have been published recently. Um, you can actually see the growth over the time period in, in terms of the number of projects. So if I explain the graph, the left hand axis is the project's return on investment, so a multiple of the amount invested, and the x axis is the quarter since release. So you can see um, we have one project here that was 18 quarters since release and we've been growing steadily uh, over the past several several years particularly in the last year and two years it looks like um, so in terms of the number of projects in the return you can see that actually there's very few that have a less than break even um, in fact if we discount this one because it's only been a quarter since its release i'm sure that will move up to be break even You've really got two or three down here out of the 20 or 30 dots on this page. So that's really impressive. And you can also see that there's the average is 2.9 times the investment return. So that is really impressive, particularly as a lot of these newer projects will probably move up and to the right as time goes on and, and improve that figure. Now, if we talk about the style of acquisition, you can see that that's also changed quite considerably over the last quarter. Uh, you can see that the acquisitions have been growing um, in terms of value and actually last year was massive and this year looks set to be significantly bigger. Um, just in February there's been 21 uh, billion krona spent uh, which is around 2 billion dollars. Um, so that's significant and already well ahead of, of where we were for the total year last year. But you can see in terms of the number of deals, the landscape has changed significantly. And this could change, uh, but last year 24 studios were bought, or 24 companies I should say. Um, this year they've doubled the spend, but they've spent it on three, so they're going for bigger acquisitions. Uh, and that really seems to be a change in their, in their policy, um, which is, is something to, to watch. But in terms of what they've done um, to date, certainly the projects that they've brought on board, the smaller cap projects, they're, they're far from junk. Um, they've really made them some significant money, so that's very impressive to see. And with those 70 games that they plan to re release this year, that will be a lot of working capital that they've been using, um, 
paying for those projects over the last several years that will suddenly be released and will, will drive some massive revenue increases this year. An example, Valheim has just released by Iron Gate Studios. They are a team of five developers, so really, really tiny studio. And they've just got this great review on, on IGN, uh, a nine score. And looking through some of the, some of the after promotions for the game, uh, they've actually sold five million copies in the first four weeks. Uh, and so, you know, that was, that was over a month ago now, so probably still rising. If we look at the, the cost of the game, uh, it's £15.49 on Steam, so $19.99 in the US. That's some substantial revenue and a massive return for that project. Uh, the, the, the emphasis on giving the developers the time they need and the, and the budget behind the game is really, really starting to pay off as they see new games come through. Uh, next up is Biomutant. Biomutant is a... Uh, Another small studio, I believe it's around 20 developers. It's been in development for many, many years. It's coming on the 25th of May, and it looks like it's, it's lining up to be a really, really big return as well. So these small projects are really starting to pay off. Now let's look at the two big acquisitions that have happened over the last quarter, starting with Gearbox Entertainment. Now, this has been widely reported as a deal that's worth $1.3 billion. But in reality, that's probably very, very far from the truth. So... $1.3 billion is the maximum that can be earned by Gearbox. But in reality, the initial payout is only worth $363 million. And of that, $175 million is actually in newly issued shares. So there's very little cash being paid here for Gearbox up front. And in order to earn the, uh, the additional payouts, there are two uh, financial earnouts. The first one and the lower cap, they need to earn an adjusted EBITDA of more than $335 million over the next six years in order to earn any tier at all. And if they don't earn that, then they earn zero. So I, I think they're gonna make more than that, but there's certainly a substantial, substantial gap to the 1.3 billion uh, that will be paid out if they if they meet all their dues and in order to to make that 1.3 billion they need to make 1.3 billion in EBITDA over the next six years and that is after game development costs have been accounted for so um, really massive earnings and far above what Gearbox are earning at the moment which is either means two things one Gearbox have some sort of secret weapon that we don't know about, or two, Embracer maybe believe they might get to one tier, but they don't believe they're gonna get all the way, in which case they won't have to pay out, which is, is a really great move by Embracer Group. Now it's worth saying there is one factor that may impact that, and that's the fact that um, 2K, one of Embracer's competitors, actually own the publishing rights to Borderlands. Borderlands is by far Gearbox's biggest IP, uh, it's sold 60 million copies across the across the series and, and Borderlands 3, which was released last year, uh, is now at 8 million copies. So a massive game. Um, that's a substantial amount of revenue, but most of it went to 2K. Now we know that 2K will still publish Borderlands and Borderlands related projects, but we don't know how long that deal will last, whether a sequel is part of that or whether um, that could be part of the deal with Embracer Group and maybe... If Gearbox and Embracer were to take back those rights, the amount that would be earned through Gearbox would be substantially more, although I do, it doesn't look like that's part of the deal. Now, the second company uh, that's been acquired is one that I'd never heard of, but I think is the much more substantial deal, an important deal in, in, this, in this big acquisition sp uh, spree. And they're called EasyBrain. Now, EasyBrain are a mobile developer, um, and cumulative installs to date is 750 million. That's absolutely huge. Now, their biggest titles are related to Sudoku. And when I searched for Sudoku on the App Store earlier on, number one was a paid, uh, a paid version of Sudoku.com. And number three was the organic search for Sudoku.com. So they are significant. That's by far their biggest. 
I also searched for jigsaw puzzles. That was the first one that it came up. There's, there's this app pixel art that seems to be quite popular. There's a, a music uh, making drum drum kit for your iPad. So they're, they're not technically, well, I guess they're not a pure games company, but as we know, the mobile space is so much bigger than the console and PC space. Uh, consoles are worth about 33 billion a year. Uh, PC is worth about 40 billion a year and mobile is worth about 83 billion a year so bigger than PC and console combined and only growing so uh, to have a, a big chunk of this space is a really really good decision now in terms of what they paid it's substantially more um, than they paid for Gearbox but I think justifiably so the day one purchase price was 640 million uh, and you know that that's really really substantial but certainly we don't know much about the the EBITDA of um, of easy brain but it's likely they're earning substantially more revenue than than gearbox are and and I'm, I'm sure that that acquisition will pay off in time now there is a third acquisition that Embracer has, has made in the last quarter after their last financial report and that was Aspire Media. And again, this is this seems an odd one, but when you think about it more, it, it makes a lot of sense for the group. So the day one purchase price of this was $100 million, so less than the other two, substantially less again, 60 million cash, 40 million in newly issued shares. So they're, they're continuing that trend of not paying all up front in cash, and then there's some, some more money that can be earned on the back end, dependent on earnings. But Aspire Group are an interesting one in terms of they have published a large number of games. So Civ 6, for example, Layers of Fear, um, Borderlands 2 here. But you can see, look, they've published for the App Store and Linux uh, in the example of Borderlands 2. So they're not the true publishers of the game. Uh, they're a porting house, essentially, and, and they'll probably do support work. They are working on their own game. Um, based on the evil, evil Dead, I believe, so they're, they're capable, a capable developer in their own right, but they're doing a lot of porting. And what they are claiming is that they have a port software that can cut down the port time by 75% versus traditional means. So really that's very powerful. And if you've got a large studio with you know, 140 plus studios working at any one time on, on different projects, a porting house that can that can cut down your port time by 75% is going to be a really good acquisition. So again, very strategic move and, and smart in my opinion. Now if we want to know what the plans are for the likes of Gearbox going forward, we probably need to think about what's happened in the past. And the only real company we can compare them to is Coke Media uh, or Deep Silver. Now, they've been with Embracer Group for three years now. They're a similar company, um, although they do have some, some different nuances. Um, they have film and merchandising, so quite unique um, in, in this space. Uh, and they, they uh, publish German versions of films, so they publish the German version of Parasite, the, the Oscar-winning film. Um, they publish the Naruto series in, in Germany, so some, some strange ones, but they do see good revenue from it. Um, and in terms of what Embracer did with Coke Media, they, they didn't really deviate from their strategy, and, and they've said all the way through that they'll let developers continue to do what they're doing already, but they do provide capital and they do spur on growth. So what we can see is that between February 2018 and February 2021, um, just in organic growth, Coke Media grew 39%, which is pretty substantial um, for, for organic growth for any company. And when we think about what they did otherwise, uh, they actually grew su substantially more than that, uh, growing 147%, including inorganic growth. So what that means is basically including mergers and acquisitions. We can probably expect similar for Gearbox. And in fact, uh, one of the things that was announced in the investor presentation is that really they want to use Gearbox as an entry into the American market, as they have done with Coke, in, uh, into the German-speaking market. So perhaps Gearbox could be 
leveraged in order to secure acquisitions in the American market that it may have been harder for Embracer to to acquire otherwise if they didn't have that American arm. So I expect to see organic growth from Gearbox, but also heavy, heavy acquisition through their arm of, of the Embracer family. Now, let's look at the financials. Now, this is a really impressive first slide. You can see the total net sales for the group increased by 44% year over year. Now, obviously that's based on significant number of acquisitions, um, but you can see that games are driving that, plus 62% year on year. And what's important is games are the most profitable area for Embracer Group, uh, much more profitable than publishing other people's games um, or publishing other people's films. Obviously, if you're publishing your own product, you make money on the on the publisher end and the developer end, which is which is much more profitable. So their operational EBIT is plus one hundred percent year on year, which is truly amazing. Even more amazing when they self declare that it's primarily driven by the strong back catalogue, and really that they didn't have any new games come out this year. That's the amazing thing, and they're still growing at that rate. Now, they've, they've got 150 projects in the pipeline, as we've said. They've got 113 development studios. And with that, next year, further down here, and maybe into the next quarter with Biomutant that begins, you can see one hell of a step up in revenue here. So let's get into that. Um, one of the things, the amazing things, is, is that jump up. And you can see here, the upcoming releases, we've been trickling along here. This is the trailing 12 month uh, cost of released games. So cost, not, not revenue. But you can see full year 2020, 2021, they expect to be 840 to 860. So a slight dip even, probably because of the lack of new releases. But look at 2021, 2022. We're tripling. We are going to see massive sales revenues, and that's driven by 70 of the projects that they're working on. This 100 and what was it? 140 projects, 150 projects. Um, 70 of those are due to release next year. Now, you know, we know game development. Probably that's going to drop to 50, 60, if they're lucky. Uh, but still, that is a substantial increase again, tripling your revenue year over year. That would be an amazing thing. Uh, also worth noting, 13 acquisitions in this quarter. So a couple to point out. Uh, Zen Studios make Zen Pinball. Uh, lots of licensed pinball games. You know, not massive, but steady earners and, and definitely on a continuous basis. They're pumping out Zen games. So that's, that's good. A nice studio acquisition. Um, but another strategic one here, Quantic Lab. Now, Quantic Lab are a QA... Um, QA house and you can see they've got clients from all across the gaming industry but also outside the gaming industry but you know you you want to um, get some money off or you know more profit when you're QA testing games that are your own so Deep Silver here for example but hey why not steal some money off Ubisoft CD Projekt Red and, and uh, take money off your competitors. That's a, another great acquisition. So all going in the right direction there. Now, perhaps one of the most important things as a shareholder is this small box in the bottom right here that most people wouldn't pay much attention to. But the board has decided to file for IR, IFRS conversion. Now that's in itself not a major thing, but what it means is they're, they're looking to financially report according to all the standards of, of the world stock exchanges. And they want to become listed on a regulated market within 18 to 36 months. Now, at the moment, they are not registered with a legitimate stock exchange. You have to do what's called an OTC order or an over-the-counter order, which certain brokerages do but you won't find these guys on Trading212 or, or any app like that or Robinhood or anything like that um, because they're not 
regulated uh, to that level. Now, what that would bring is a greater awareness, a greater liquidity of the shares, which may initially see a sell-off even, that may bring the price down initially, but certainly it, it will raise the price of the shares once it's more readily available, more people see who these guys are and, and what their numbers are. And those financial reports will be published. They'll be on, who knows, CNBC, wherever it is, um, and, and available to everyone to view, and, and it will drive a lot more investment in this company. It's really important. So I just want to show you a quick clip um, from the investor presentation where they go into a bit more detail on that. Turning to the IFRS transition that you announced today, uh, just to clarify, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned the listing. Um, uh, well, first of all, what does that mean that you will turn to a regulated list? Does it imply the main list in Sweden or could it uh, apply to international markets I think, as well? Uh, sorry, you all. Stepping please, in here. Yeah, please, that was hand. better for you. So, well, we, we haven't really started negotiating with uh, and discussing Nasdaq. Uh, obviously, we, we, we know them well and, and we like them. And most likely, I assume we will agree to, to do a main listing in Stockholm. But, you know, we haven't started that process and there is other stock exchanges. So I think it's just an interest to figure out, is there alternatives? Uh, you know, our shareholder base is, is a lot of Swedish institutions and Nordic institutions, but that shareholder base are over time changing. And I think it's also important we would like to have conversations with our institutional sharehold, shareholders in this process, how they see on, on this question as well. Uh, and, you know, how long term committed they are to embrace as shareholders as well. Um, so there is various factors in this. And I think it's, you know, it's already quite expensive to be listed on the first north, but it's much more expensive to be listed on the main market. And we're talking big money. Uh, so I would like to understand these fees, you know, what are we getting for it? So that's really interesting. And I really like the fact that they're not just thinking about, oh, we need to get on the NASDAQ there. They're thinking about which is better, which would work for us as a company best. So they're, they're being logical, they're thinking things through, they're not just FOMOing and wanting to, to get listed right away. So um, in terms of what the benefits would be of NASDAQ versus uh, the Stockholm Stock Exchange though, I, I think they should have called it Stock Stock, but never mind, they missed a, missed a chance. Um, if you look at the charts, the long-term charts, is the five-year charts, I mean, the Nasdaq has been absolutely soaring, as everyone knows. It's no surprise to anyone. But the Stockholm Stock Exchange isn't that different. In fact, it, uh, it's climbed much more rapidly over the last year. You can see maybe it was flatter um, a few years back, but certainly over the past three years, it's really, really um, picked up. And, you know, there are some substantial companies on there. There's H&M. Um, there's a few fairly substantial banks on here. There's Volvo, um, there's AstraZeneca. So there are some significant companies on this stock exchange and they're doing absolutely fine. That would not be a problem at all and there'd still be a significant increase on investment if they were able to, to list on the Stockholm 30. Now, um, one other thing worth mentioning and I'm not sure exactly how the, the uh, listing plays into this, but corporation tax is significantly lower in Sweden so versus the US. So 20.6% is the Swedish uh, corporation tax rate um, versus a US corporation tax rate at the moment of 28%. And obviously Biden was just uh, scared everyone that he might be increasing corporation tax even further. So there's, there's a benefit to them being based in Sweden versus their US peers. So we've said a lot of positive things about Embracer Group. Now onto the financials, and it is a mixed bag. Uh, they are growing massively, 35, 34% year over year over the past five years. And I really believe based on the acquisitions they've made and, and the number of games they've got coming out over the next couple of years, that they'll probably do a lot better than that over the next couple of years. I wouldn't be surprised if they doubled that figure over the next two years. So definitely one to watch out for. Um, their profit margins being low is not a concern with this level of growth, these level of acquisitions, 
it's it's really not a concern and not what they'll be focusing on they'll be focused much more on growth um, we know there's a consolidation in the market and they're trying to chase um, and, and beat their competitors who are also buying up many many studios but what does concern me slightly is the dilution of the shares um, now it's not an immediate concern the share price has been steadily growing even though significantly more shares are being issued every time they acquire a company. And they are issuing um, shares, but they're also growing the pie. So it's, it's not like they're issuing shares for no reason, um, but, but it is a concern if they continue to do it and they do it too liberally. But I think they're issuing the right number of shares at the moment, that they're in line with the, with the value of the companies that they're acquiring, so it's not too much of a concern. They did raise a lot of capital last year um, by raising shares, and if they continue to do so, they need to fund the growth to go alongside that. The other thing is their price-to-earnings ratio. Now, again, price-to-earnings ratio is not the right, uh, the right statistic to use in this example, um, but you know, simply Wall Street here says they are overvalued. I personally agree, uh, 345 times the, the P2E ratio is steep. Um, if we look at the price to sales ratio, which isn't on Simply Wall Street, it's 12.34. Uh, it's and really, you want that to be between 6 and 10, in my opinion. So, um, you know, above the industry average, but, but for a growing company, you know, you know, maybe that's okay. But I just feel they need a slight correction um, the market cap is 13 and a half billion at the moment so I would start buying if it dropped below 10 um, I think one of the reasons why maybe it's not is because it's probably well it's very heavily privately owned so there's probably not a lot of liquidity if they were to to um, to enter a, a proper regulated market I think we'd see lots more shares lots more liquidity and it will be it will probably see an initial price drop so I'll be watching for that and if I can pick up some shares at around a 10 billion market cap I, I certainly will be doing so but talking about them versus the companies around them uh, they've got some much bigger caps so if we look at 10 cent being the largest on here they're absolutely nowhere near that uh, 761 billion that's a massive company and obviously they've got huge numbers of companies and, and diversifications and the epic store and all that for 10 cents so not necessarily a surprise there um, but more they will be looking to compete with the likes of maybe Activision Blizzard um, EA those sorts of size market caps so they're looking to compete with you know 72 billion 41 billion and, uh, and as we know they've got double the number of studios of EA so much smaller they've got half the employees but double the number of studios but still that's uh, you know neither here nor there that they, they could compete in certain areas they obviously don't have the sports sports titles of ea they don't have the blizzard titles and they don't have a uh, call of duty that activision blizzard have but you know they need to get a massive franchise of their own uh, and that would really kick them off and, and bring them up the leaderboard also worth noting, they are not too under Take Two, um, who are a, a very, very substantial player in the industry as well. So I, I do feel they're they're a bit overpriced. Um, they're slightly above Zynga, which you know Zynga has fallen um, has fallen off. Their their mobile games are are not what they once were, but they're still a big, big player. Uh, Zynga, I think, will be a direct competitor of Embracer. But Embracer are also fighting on all those other fronts. Uh, they'll obviously be competing in the Sudoku, uh, Sudoku apps um, and, and other mobile apps that they're developing at the moment and acquiring at the moment. But then if we look further down the list, you start to see some companies that really are a similar value to Embracer or, or you know, should be more on a level playing field so ubisoft at 9.5 billion um, probably you know they're probably similar size to embracer and, and 
I'd say bigger at the moment, although I think Embracer have much more forward growth potential. They've also got big names like Capcom, Square Enix, CD Projekt Red who are significantly cheaper, but again I don't think they have the diversification that Embracer have and therefore the forward opportunity. They may have better value now, certainly Capcom have been on a roll recently and released some great titles, but um, Embracer has more forward potential I think. With that said, uh, I, I don't think I'll be buying yet, um, and I'll be waiting for that 10 billion market cap, if it ever comes along. I hope that it does, um, because this is a company that I really like. That wraps up our look at Embracer Group. Uh, if you like the video, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. I'd really appreciate feedback. This is my first video, so any feedback, welcome, positive or negative. And there's also a link in the description below to the Trading212 referral app, if you don't already have it. Uh, you can get a free share there. But thank you for listening and enjoy your day.